Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, Optimal Health Associates, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. It is September 23rd, about 9 p.m. Just got off a over hour conference call with the chief medical officers of all the, or most, of the Oklahoma City medical facilities and Lawton. A uh, great group of medical professionals. We also had one CEO from Norman on tonight, um, Richie Split, who was just outstanding. But I want to give true credit to all of them. All these people are, took an hour and 15 minutes from 7.30 to 8.45 to spend trying to figure out how do we ready the, for this COVID um, outbreak that's surging through the state. We have a tremendous number of patients at Integris, Norman, Mercy, uh, Midwest City, OU, Lawton, and everyone's really overachieving, but we're at uh, a point where if, it, if we continue to surge like we are, we're, we are going to start having some trouble. So there's a plan in place. We have several ideas. We're going to be circling the wagons with a group of even higher level hospital system leaders. Oh, I forgot Mercy, and Mercy was is also very involved and very, uh, I don't want to leave anyone out, and um, they're doing their tremendous work with their COVID patients and have a great load too. So all these different entities are going to be moving forward together to try to coordinate a path of excellent care for all of the patients if the surge that is currently going on continues. I think um, it probably will. On the other side, we should get some, from those of us wearing masks and washing our hands and being careful, that's going to lower some flu activity. There's some data out of Australia that Dr. Cameron Manter brought up showing that on the positive side, at least, uh, there is some benefit of limiting flu with what we're doing besides COVID and all of that matters and helps. And we're going to get to flu today. I'm going to do a flu review. So the quick final summary in Oklahoma is we're running about a thousand cases a day. Our death rate um, is still very, very low relatively to the number of people. We're only at about 1.1%, one and a 1 .1%, which is much lower than the rest of the world overall. So we have a lot to be proud of here in Oklahoma, but the next step is to get coordination if the case numbers rise. And so that's in process. Uh, I think that was a central, my central ideas on COVID tonight is simply that, no, we're moving as a community medically and administratively towards a very formalized, hopefully coordinated effort. Um, and even we're gonna be looking at coordination with hopefully getting AMSA involved, looking at just comparing uh, notes uh, clinically across the different facilities and how they're approaching patients. And some of this may seem strange to you that aren't in medicine, but communication isn't always all that great between doctors. And we have different hospital systems and people are employed, so they don't talk that much. And you know, there's egos and all that stuff. But this, this group is just fantastic. And one of them, again, I think it was Cameron Mantor said, hey, why don't we see whatever, why don't we all get our people together and talk about what they're finding is working besides looking at what the FDA said. Now, he didn't say this part besides what the FDA is saying, but he said, let's get us, get our, our uh, clinical leaders together who are managing these patients and compare notes and really see what we're doing. Now, I'm going to tell you, since we're doing so awesome overall as a state with this in terms of the critical care, um, I'll be surprised if there's that much differences since <laughs> they're so outstanding, all of the different facilities. But uh, again, I think it's a great idea. Once again, let's compare notes. Let's think. Let's group think. Well, that's what makes Oklahoma special and Oklahoma is special. So again, very proud of our uh, state. Very proud to be a member of the of Oklahoma and to call myself an Oklahoman. So, and this was made me very proud tonight. Uh, we also had a new uh, CMO there tonight who I've never mentioned, Julie Watson, who just became C his acting CMO at Integra. She was wonderful. So all positives with COVID and getting ready for it. So now I'm ready to talk about flu. I'm going to talk about flu very specifically tonight in 18 to 65 year olds. Now I may break that into slightly generalized categories for in terms of good health. Oh, some mild to moderate health problems. Let's say you have arthritis and you're taking a biologic agent, so a chemotherapy, or you have Crohn's and you're on a chemotherapy, or then high risk or groups that have real problems. You have HIV, you are an active cancer patient, 
being treated with chemo. You have uh, oh, terrible diabetes. You're obese with horrible heart disease. You're a high-risk patient then. And I'm not going to be talking about people under 18 or pregnant women tonight. And I'm not going to talk again about over 65. So what is the Cochrane Review from 2018 say, which is a systemic review on um, all flu. And it's really an ongoing 15 to 20 year summary, which they update periodically. So I actually made some diagrams tonight and drawings just because I thought it would be easier and it helps me remember a little bit too. So how does the whole flu thing work? Well, what happens is there's four centers, London, Atlanta, Tokyo. So this is how it all works. London, Atlanta, Tokyo, and Melbourne. And they're, they're basically our CDC and places like CDC, the CDC in England, Japan, and Australia. And they send what the flu strains they're seeing over the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization then looks at the antigens or the proteins on the viral particles and then thinks well what antigens are going to be important for next year and then they combine them into a packet of information that you inject or a vaccine to stimulate your body to make antibodies antibodies okay so it kind of goes world health organization strain antigens packet which is the vaccine it'll be the same for covid in some respects and then we see what the antibody response is and so this is what's really interesting about this, this is one of the first points in the study um, the world health organization for years said well if you have a great antibody response you're going to have great results well it turns out that's not true in, with flu at all you can have a really great antibody response and then you have no immunity so it's pretty crazy there's times when having the when they pick the right strains it works and there's times when they pick the wrong strains and it doesn't work. It's, there's times when they seem to pick the right strains and it doesn't work either. And, and so when you look at this breadth of data um, over the years, the key concept is we went from about a 10% effectiveness rate to a 60% effectiveness rate. And the effectiveness is basically based on relative risk. So the way to look at that means if you have a 2% chance of getting the flu in the year and if you vaccinate everyone and the overall risk drops to 1%, 1 divided by 2 is 50%. So you have a 50% vaccine efficacy rate. So it's a relative risk. And then relative risk is always a tricky subject because relative risk is somewhat silly because it's really a more I don't know, a big pharma concept to sell stuff in my mind. But so you get relative risks increase, but you also get absolute risks increase. So this is the data for the influenza vaccine. And so we break influenza data sets into two groups. We break it into influenza officially, so like where you have a full flu infection. And you also break it into influenza-like illness where you get sick, you get a bad cold, but it's not the end of the world. And there's tons and tons of things that cause that that aren't influenza. So if you look, what's the efficacy for the flu vaccine? Any guesses? Look at each other. What's the overall eff efficacy in terms of what's your change? I said, what's your absolute risk change? And how often do you get the flu? So you actually get the flu 2.4% of the time a year. So it takes 2.4 people out of 100 to, will get influenza. How many less get it if you vaccinate? Well, in the best data, it's 0.9%. So you get about a 1.4 or 1.3 uh, decrease. But influenza-like illness, so some of us get cold or flu symptoms that aren't so severe, it's 21.5%. It drops to 18. So this is the first stuff to think about. So we go from... And this is the best data, not all the data. This is the best data. So about a little over 2% risk to about 1%, and you go from about 21% to about 18%. So 
not huge changes, really, um, when you think about it. And so what does that mean for how many people do you have to treat with a vaccine to prevent the infection? So with influenza, when you look at that, it's 71, you have to treat 71 patients to prevent one illness. Now the influenza-like stuff is really interesting. If you're healthy, I mean, and I'd be considered healthy uh, uh, as a 56 year old with no major medical problems, and that's not including taking vitamins. Um, if I do the flu vaccine, how, or how many people have to get it to prevent one influenza-like illness? It's 167, which seems perhaps like a lot. If you have moderate illness, you're the person who has rheumatoid arthritis or ulcerative colitis and are on a biologic chemotherapeutic agent. Uh, your rate is you need to in inject 29 people to prevent one. And if you're a high, high-risk person, you're actively with cancer, you're getting chemo, um, seven people need to be infected or injected with the vaccine to prevent one. So what that shows you is it's really some odd numbers. And remember, influenza-like illnesses are not the same intensity of influenza official illnesses. And that there's a little subtle difference there in terms of intensity of how sick you get. But it's, but it's important to realize. So basically, you get about a 50% to 60% reduction in your risk, but you're going for about 2% to 1% for influenza. And if you're reasonably healthy, you're going from 21 to 18 or 19. So not huge numbers. And, and so that's what we have to remember about these vaccines is the numbers for normal risk people are very marginal. And again, I'm not saying don't get the vaccine. I'm not saying get the vaccine. I'm just giving you the data on the vaccines. So if you start thinking, well, what are the negatives to the vaccine? I can tell you from reading this very long paper, which I post, I will post, that and this one was like 200 pages long versus the one on 65 year olds was 95 pages long. This is why it's taken a while to reread it again to make sure I understood it pretty fully. Um, but I wouldn't say I'm, I understand every single statistical model on it because there's so many. But the bottom line is this, that influenza vaccines do backfire and you can get original antigenic sin or you can, it can have a blocking effect on your immunity and that's shown multiple times in the paper. But in some subgroups it can be helpful. So I think the clearest benefit would be for people who are really, really ill with lots of medical problems that the influenza vaccine may prevent an influenza-like illness uh, but the overall benefit for influenza, even in that group, is only about a 50% reduction or going from 2% to 1%. So you just have to remember that, that the, the flu vaccine stuff is not, it's not a panacea. It's not anything I think that's really that impressive um, for a normal, healthy 18 to 65 year old. I just the data isn't there to say, oh, this is a great idea for you. Likewise, it's there's no data showing really neurologic injury or paralysis or any of that stuff either. So um, not the most exciting rendition I, I think I could have given on this subject. But again, I kind of get befuddled by by reading through all of it and thinking, God, this is reasonably boring stuff. And these poor guys who and gals who read all this and have put together these summaries saying that, you know, it's after looking at, you know, eight, so 80,000 patients across 25 different trials, one set and another set, and they basically say, eh, it may be helpful, depending on your perspective. But it is not, it is absolutely not something that has this huge, massive benefit in a healthy 18 to 65 year old. Um, if you're a pretty sickly, person in that group, you may want to think about it. Your doctor is obviously going to ask you to do it, I hope, or their provider. But again, it's always about judgment of what you think. Um, and then if you have mild risk or mild to moderate risk, uh, again, there's some benefit, but it's not huge. So anyway, that's kind of the thought 
upon it. And I would always close with the idea with immunology is our immune systems are finite. And if we're always revving them up against vaccines, are they going to rev up when we need them to against other stuff? Especially since we know from the data that having large amounts of an appropriate antibody to the right virus from a vaccine sometimes doesn't even help you. So I just think it's an interesting subject and talk about it with your doctors. I will post the paper and good night.